a great honor to be here and a pleasure to, and, uh, to be with all of you and I'll stay until Friday and we can talk further. Um, all right, so this lecture is going to have three topics. So after two of them, we are going to, with about an hour and a half, we are going to have a break, just so you know. Um, how many of you have a cell phone, not even smartphone, but let's say cell phone? Everyone, right? <laughs> what kind of question is that? How many of you know what kind of codes we have in cell phones? Triple codes, LDPC codes, uh, some other codes. Right? So we have right now a triple code. Um, and we are about to have Raptor code, so we'll talk about that a little. Suppose you would like to see a movie. Um, do you guys know which movie is this? Okay, so some do. Which one? Godfather. Which actor is this? Oh, too old. <laughs> All right, so suppose you want to um, See, uh, I hope you link my slides a little bit shifted up. Is there a way to shift the screen a little down? Oh. I, I'll just go on. It's just that, you know, there is this black line and then I, it's probably not going to be a problem. But suppose you want to, to see a movie from, from a, which is somewhere in the cloud uh, and you want to see it on your cell phone. That has to go over a, a base station and what you do, you chunk all along the way. The file, oh. that's fine, it's fine. Okay, oh, it's first. No, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Up to position. Oh, actually, it's a little, wow. All right, so look at this one, or oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> this one has better resolution. So all, uh, all along the way we do this uh, chunking. So file has, uh, let's say, KC chunks, and then chunk, uh, chunks have, uh, have KP packets. These are units which go through the network, and then packet has KC symbols, and we usually work with these symbols, and we are kind of trying to move up there. So now what you do, uh, you ask yourself, do I need coding anywhere here, right? Do I have coding anywhere here? So I said there are some coding in cell phones and therefore there are in uh, base stations because you have to have the receiver and the transmitter. How about coding in the clouds? Would I need that for something? So in the cloud, I would need a code if I want to store my content. I want to store it redundantly. And the reason is that some of the disks may die, right? So I would like to store that redundantly. And uh, on the physical layer, why do I need codes to fight noise? So but what we do, we look at, do we need coding? Yeah, maybe um, I really don't know. So you turn back, you're back to the problem and you start looking into books. And that's what we do actually at the labs, uh, which is not the right thing to do. Then we hire, a a few summer interns, and they barricade themselves by books. And they never really look back in the problem. They just want to see what's, what's out there in the literature, whereas there are experts on the second floor, we are on the fourth, who can tell them what actually is needed. So uh, can we say, can we somehow change that? And Roberto Padovani, who gave uh, uh, funding for this lecture, actually is in Qualcomm, uh, working in industry. And so in his honor, and also to talk about some of my work, which you actually almost never hear at conferences, at conferences in the past 10 years, maybe you've heard me talk about network coding, quantum network coding, and such, such things. All right, so on the physical layer, uh, we, we want to code, we want to put redundancy to combat noise. On the uh, cloud level, we want to put redundancy to address 
possible loss in the cloud of um, dying disk, uh, shutting down, um, or, or something like that. So that is what it is for. Uh, but at the end of the talk, we are going to say, we are going to show that actually we can use that coding for some other things as well. Do we not ever need to code at the, in the intermediate level? Somehow looks like an artificial level. So we have all these, somehow the cloud and the phone are separated. So the cloud needs protection because you know, the, the devices may go offline or, or go uh, broke or something like that. And uh, physical layer has noise, but what about this intermediate level? Do we need to code there? So it looks like it's some kind of a concatenated code to, together with the physical layer and therefore really cannot be better than anything you could do in the physical layer. That's the first thing you think of. Uh, in a multi-user environment, that's actually not the case. So we don't need to code on, on this layer. And this is exactly what is now being uh, implemented or uh, deployed in products. In the, on the physical layer, we have hybrid air queue. And that is what I'm going to first talk about. On the, uh, on the uh, applications layer, we have uh, applications layer ALFEC, they're often called. A particular one is Raptor codes. There is a particular implementation called Raptor Q. And then uh, at the uh, cloud level, we are going to look into something called fork join Q uh, in connection with coding. So what do, you, uh, do, uh, do you know what these queues are for? In, the, in hybrid air queue, what is queue? In air queue, what is queue for? Request. Uh, what is queue for in a raptor queue? It's for Qualcomm. That's, uh, that, that's the, where, where uh, Padovani works. Uh, and what is in fork join queue, queue for? It's for waiting in line. Any queuing theorist here? No, okay, we will learn something. All right, so different queues at different places. So first we are going to talk about hybrid air queue. So in air queue, the receiver uh, detects errors that you have and then asks for a transmission, right? Uh, this is like in a, in a regular uh, conversation. If you don't hear something, you say, oh, sorry, what? Or I beg your pardon. Or you kind of repeat whatever you've heard so far and you ask for it. So, so it's actually even in everyday conversation, we have uh, certain things that are used as protocols among machines, among phones and base stations. So how long does it take to get uh, a message across? If probability of error is some PE, right? This problem is like um, tossing a, a coin with certain bias and waiting for a head to come. So you can compute that, right, from a first principles of probability. And the expected value is one minus uh, probability of error. So the greater the probability of error, the more you are going to be retransmitting. Right? So in hybrid RQ, you put in a code and you say, I am going to change this probability of error. Uh, and therefore, I will have fewer, I will change the bias of my coin. But there is a price to pay. What is the price to pay? With codes? What do we sacrifice when we put coding? Redundancy. So uh, there is a trade off there. And in perfect, if, if you have, whenever you put a code, it's called a hybrid, right? Between RQ and coding. Uh, but since we ha if you have a uh, very good information about the channel and that is consistent with channel behavior, the channel doesn't change, then it's fine. You choose your code, adjust it to the channel, and that's it. In all of uh, the talk today, we don't have a constant channel. And in life, uh, we don't have a constant channel, right? So there is no such thing. So we have to adjust the redundancy of, 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 uh, of transmission. Um, and there are protocols called incremental redundancy, and they're appropriate for, the, for wireless. Um, all right. So how do we perform hybrid air We take information and code it by lowering another code, then information 
information and some quality bits are sent over the channel. If that doesn't prove the trust, the receiver asks for more bits. More signals to be sent. So effectively, each transmission produces a code word of strong code. So suppose you want to say code Shannon and to the post office you want to shout out called Shannon. And uh, you can say it in a different way, right? You can say the pattern of information theory. Um, but if someone just uh, didn't hear called Shannon very well, there might be a problem with his mind.
decide about is how many bits were sent, which bits, and at what power. Parameter, 
which actually aligns the probability uh, distribution, conditional probability distribution at the output of the channel when one is transmitted versus when zero is transmitted. These are only two things that you can transmit. And the probability distribution can be discrete, continuous. All right. So this the Charlie parameter actually measures the distance between conditional when one and conditional when zero. And it's a, it's a very strong measure. It's equivalent actually to the variational distance between the two probability distributions. So when it's uh, zero, actually it's a good channel. If it's variational distance, if it's, if it's uh, zero, then it's bad, right? So, uh, and if it's one, uh, it's a bad channel. So um, does anyone know <laughs> If, uh, how can I, use, if I have, let's say, sequence X and sequence X prime, which are transmitted to a channel with probability, with, uh, with uh, uh, the Charlie parameter gamma, uh, what would be the probability that the receiver confuses one for the other?
So yes, you have this distance. What happens when you puncture a cord? Not only that you are puncturing the cord, but these parts of your cord will go over different channels. So you definitely don't know what. If you write just the expression for the error probability, you get something called split fake enumerator. Because uh, different pieces of code words go to different channels. And that really no one got into. And I don't want to spend kind of a lifetime looking into this, so let's see how uh, we can go around this with the assumptions we have. Um, in addition to not being able to look into, uh, not, not being uh, able to know what happens when different code, uh, different pieces uh, of a code are sent to different channel, we don't even know what happens when some of them are in addition not even transmitted. Okay. But because of all our assumptions, and these are that the bit is assigned to transmission change in probability alpha j, so all of them are kind of statistically identical. So that is going to also play a role. Another is the bits which are not yet transmitted, we can assume that they are transmitted over a really bad channel. And for a bad channel, we have gamma 1, so we can use that. And when we put that into this scary looking equation, we actually get back our formula, our union bound, but now with, uh, with this gamma, in a way, average over transmissions, including the transmission which didn't even take place. And what we need to require is the threshold equation to be satisfied. So this gamma n, which is the Charlie parameter and transmission n, which includes that beyond that you have not even transmitted, has to be smaller than some function of the threshold. And then you get very transparent transmission rules with this. You can say that uh, we can choose alpha or gamma, because choosing alpha is a which transmission we need to decide how much more to send and what power. The part which contains power here is what? We have alphas and gammas. What contains power, what contains number of bits? So a bit is assigned to a transmission j, probability alpha j. So alpha
little bit uh, like uh, what we uh, when, uh, what we do in a in a regular uh, interaction. Um, if you um, are talking with someone and you know that there is a, a truck passing, you know that this person didn't hear you. What would you do? You would repeat the whole thing, right? If you're talking with someone on the phone and you don't know what's going on there, but that person has a baby crying, uh, what, what would you do? You can repeat the whole thing. But you somehow have to be communicated what to do in order to choose what to say next and how much to shout. And this is basically what this protocol is telling you. Um, so, okay. Um, Let's see now. Um, we were talking here about the binary um, input channel. And let's say if we want to look, we are transmitting this over a Gaussian noise. So, suppose here you have the binary, CB over N0, let's say ES over N0. And you have here, let's say, 10 dB. And here you have minus 6 dB. That would be something that's used in practice. And somewhere here you have zero, right? And here you are looking at rates. So um, how does the channel capacity look like? Um, this channel here is yesterday, yesterday here, Lele. How does the channel capacity look like? What is the maximum it can be? This is a uh, SNR. And I want to see how the channel, don't even look at the numbers, just tell me the, the shape. It's a binary input. Do we have a closed form? Binary input. So what is the maximum it can be? Okay, great. So it's actually around here, it's already one or so. And then it goes down and maybe it's a little bit longer. At the zero, it's about 0.6. One, maybe it's not a good proportion, and then here is maybe 0.3 or something. How does a cutoff rate look like? Is it below or above this curve? Below. Okay. Looks a little bit like this with a gap increasing. Um, okay, so let's say that. What a regular rate code can do is for every point here, it can design, let's say, capacity achieving code, or close to that. But when you move out of there, let's say this is your somewhere close to here, if your SNR becomes larger, what happens to that code? Does it get a bigger throughput? It's a fixed rate code, so it cannot. So it stays here. And if it, if, if you go be below that rate, it drops, and this is called the threshold effect. So for every point, nowadays we have to design channel code and the source code. The channel code we can handle by this technique. Source code we still don't know how. So that's kind of a big challenge. If you used if you used uh, a Reed-Solomon code, hard decision decoding and Reed-Solomon code, some very high rates would give you something like this. If you, if you use a little bit lower uh, rate, it would give you like this and so on. So that would be a family of codes. But where you want to be, you want to operate here. You want to follow this. And this is what the hybrid air queue is trying to do. Uh, this triple code and triple codes in general, uh, where would this point be? 
it would be somewhere between the capacity and the cutoff rate. So, so what you achieve is something like this. And when they were invented, that was a big deal that you can go beyond the cutoff rate. All right. Uh, say, say again, please. Yes, so what is in the standard now is, uh, let's see if we still have that uh, slide. What is in the standards? What operates in your uh, what o operates in your uh, phone is exactly a triple code, an old one, an old one. It's from the old standards, and then uh, in the 90s was there. It was never changed, and then. New, uh, this, this is for, uh, for CDMA 2000 and LTE now and so on. It's, uh, it's not for all standards. And, uh, and what it does, it has a, a, a fairly large, this region. So at some point it will have to fall. And maybe here it will not achieve all the way to one. But has fairly large, this region. The new codes, we kind of tested afterwards just to see better codes. Uh, better just in the sense that they're closer to the capacity, did not have this wide range. And that is what you're after. So that is what we need to understand from, from uh, uh, the people who are implementing these things. Are they really looking to be close to the capacity or they have a wide range of operation? And so here, and in general now, for with multiple users, with long files being downloaded, with things change, where there are other people in the game, what you need to look into is not how close you are at a particular point at the capacity, but how good you are on the long run. And some very good math comes from there. So that's why this uh, talk was called Secret Lives of Code, like from theory to practice and back. And in the introductory video uh, yester yesterday about the center, Sergio Verdo was saying that uh, theory, and I mean, uh, information theories and engineers, there is this pendulum going back and forth and uh, Paul is in different codes in a, in a, at a different points of time. So yes, that's what exactly what we have in the product. Uh, any other question? We are going to move to a different topic now. So, so what we talked about now is this hybrid air Q, which is um, uh, which is already in the products. Now I'm going to tell you about a technique which is being deployed. And after the break, we are going to talk about something which we hope that will one day be in the products, not very far from now. Uh, LP and Raptor code started as a very nice mathematics and ended up being something very practical. Uh, so, we will introduce LT codes and Raptor codes and provide some insight into their design. And there are some misconceptions about this code, so we are going to address that. So when they set off on designing, and it was actually a group of computer scientists, Michael Lubi, Amin Shafralahi, who was at Bell Labs uh, at, the, at the moment, actually before even joining and then moved uh, and worked with Lubi after leaving, wanted something they called the ideal abstract property. And the encoder should be able to generate from K source symbols as many encoded symbols uh, as required for decoding. So it can go on forever. So that they call the ratelessness. So they have to be rateless. Now, any K encoded symbols should be sufficient for decoding. Right? So they wanted to make it sort of MTS. It's a linear code. You cannot go below that. So they won't. That's the ideal. They call it abstract also. And then they wanted encoding and decoding to be linear in K. So if you are designing a Raptor uh, uh, code, linear code over a field, what would be the encoding complexity in general? If you're, let's say a network code, you, you have to make a linear combination. How many multiplications do you have? Yeah, so it would be n squared, but they want it linear. If you are decoding, you have to invert the matrix. How many uh, operations is that? Okay, so it's close, uh, it's still actually, 
if you do a Gaussian elimination is, is uh, k cubed, but then this three is getting slowly creeping down, but very slowly. In fact, uh, here one of your colleagues, what is your name? Um, so, uh, uh, can the Raptor codes really, uh, really do that? So why they are uh, you know, of interest uh, today? Because they are rateless, they can adapt. Again, they are adapting their redundancy to changing channel conditions. And they are used for this uh, protocol, which are you are going to hear more and more about. It's called Multimedia Broadcast Multicast Services, MBMS. And then very often you have this ease. LTE long-term evolution and ease around. Uh, so so uh, one of these products which we are going to mention is, is uh, I, the idea is to uh, actually almost the practice to, to have Raptor codes there. So how do, do uh, Raptor codes can do that? In the beginning there were LT codes. So with LT codes what you do you start with your case symbols. Now we are in the erasure channel. Some people have asked me, are erasure channels practical? Yes, at the applications layer, these channels are erasure channels. So, so. Uh, so we start with some case symbols. Here K is six. It goes from zero to five. And then we want to start ratelessly encoding these case symbols into N symbols. So what we do, we take some kind of a K-faced coin with a particular bias. Every phase can turn into, uh, uh, up with a certain probability. Here, K is six, so I have chosen uh, a die. In fact, I took eight dice because I want to uh, generate eight output, outputs. And these are probabilities, 0, 5, 0 0.5, 1, and, and so on. And you toss the first one, one comes up, and that tells you you have to choose one and connect to these, one from the upper part. And I've chosen the first one for this picture not to look messy, but you at random choose one. You toss another one, two comes up, you again choose two at random and you exhaust them. Again, I've chosen the first two just for the picture's sake, but uh, in the analysis you choose two at random. And, then, and so on. Half of these uh, should be twos because eight is large enough for the long large numbers to kick in. So half of these are twos, and that's important. And uh, there are some which actually XOR all the, uh, or almost all the symbols. Okay. So that's how they are formed. And that's rateless, right? Because you can be tossing your die as long as you wish. So ratelessness is taken care of. But then you can say, you know, Random linear network, what we call network codes now, random linear codes, are also rateless. Like you'd be making linear combinations forever, right? But what should be better there is decoding. So we definitely want, uh, hope to be able to recover x values from y values. And, okay, and when can we choose that? We discussed the random codes. So when can we, uh, can we hope to do that? Uh, the minimum is six, because these are linear equations that we need to receive. And in this particular uh, channel, we uh, did not receive Y4 and Y5. So the receiver just doesn't have them. So we just remove them, right? They're not there. And now we want to decode. Of course, we can invert a matrix, but that in general will cost us a lot. So. Let's see how we can do that. We have here x0, and uh, we don't know what it is, but then we notice that x0 is actually connected to y0, and nothing else is connected to y0. And therefore, uh, I can read it off. So x0 and y0 are the same, so I can just read it off. The next thing I can do is remove x0 from wherever it appears. It appears at one place. Now I can read off y, uh, y1. Now, uh, from y1, x1. Now I can remove x1 from the two equations it appears. That's uh, over there. Now what remains is y2 to be read off. Again, removing x2 and so on. And the complexity here is determined by the number of edges in this decoding graph. 
because every edge that remained has to be removed or at least a, 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 a large subset of it in order to be able to read all the Equi oh, sorry, all, all, all the equations, so on, okay. So the complexity is determined by the number of edges. Is that linear in, uh, in K? Under our probabilistic model, it's not and actually cannot even be. All right. So, um, Let's go back to the design objectives. Uh, so uh, what we are having here is data symbols that are mapped into code symbols. It can be infinite mapping. And uh, the code symbols are linear combinations of data symbols. And for each yi in LT codes, we first choose this degree. That was through this multi-faced coin. And then pick a tra so, so that it just tells us how many of alphas in these equations are going to be non-zero. And then I have to choose alphas, the value, which I didn't do here because I had a binary field, and also where to place them. So I know the number, I have to choose where to place them, and I want to choose what they will be. I can choose them uniformly at random from a field. And this distribution with which these alphas are chosen uh, should enable simple linear time decoding as soon as little bit more than k, or k times 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon would be something that goes to zero when, when k is goes to infinity, are received. And the question is, can such degree distribution be found? And the answer is, it cannot actually. Although, uh, that's a theorem which has to be shown, and it's really nowhere spelled out that way. So, sort of like the spell of hidden variables. There are enough uh, surprises even in a regular probability, uh, let alone quantum. So it cannot be, let uh, maybe give you a hint why. Okay. Um, okay, so we may be able to recover x1 to xk from some n, and I didn't tell you what n is, some n y's, only if two conditions are satisfied. One is, n has to be greater than k. Why? Because I need more equations than unknowns. Another, there have to be k log k edges incident to these y's. That you would have to prove as a, as a theorem. Um, intuition why this is, why k log k? Why not just k or k squared or something like that? It's a covering result, exactly. So balls and bins, but unfortunately not at the class, if you want to go, actually I just recently started thinking again about it. Uh, so the intuition is exactly that, it's a covering balls and bins. If you have, uh, n bins or k bins, you have to have k log k balls which you are tossing at random to those bins in order to have every bin covered. Our bins are the k unknowns. Why do I have to have them covered? So I have to have k equations with k unknowns. But I have to have actually all my unknowns be represented somewhere. So in order to have them covered, I have to uh, uh, have this many edges. Um, this, this is a, a little bit more a general problem, which actually has also been looked into uh, in the 60s by Russians, Hungarians. They found some papers first in these languages and then later uh, in some statistical literature in language, uh, in uh, English uh, uh, related problems. But it's not an easy thing to derive actually. It becomes much more complex and only the expectation is known as opposed to the entire probability distribution. So there is some nice mathematics there 
that comes out of this actually practical question, uh, how many edges do I need? Because that determines my complexity. All right. So uh, the distribution that was proposed in the original paper is this ideal soliton degree distribution, um, which somehow looks uh, so that when you find the expected degree of this thing, you would have a log n, the expected average uh, degree. Um, because you would multiply d by pd, and that would cancel, and that basically becomes the harmonic number, which becomes log. So, so that was the goal, to ensure that log. So they, they said, let's forget for a moment that I want linear. Let's just take a log. Can I do a log at least? And the answer is yes, we can cover them. Um, and uh, what we need in order to have a decoding uh, failure rate at most delta, we need to have k times this log square k over delta square root of k. Uh, to receive. And so you look at this and you say, okay, let's say the coding failure is something small, but let's, uh, let's be generous here and let's say that generous towards the redundancy and let's assume it's one because everything else actually will give me higher the required redundancy. Whenever I put delta which is greater than one, then, then this, this term in the bracket will become larger. So, so let's be generous here and say delta is one. And then you say, aha, log square of k over square root of k, that goes to zero, and people are happy. It turns out when you plot these, even for a length uh, 10,000, you have a very, uh, you require a large redundancy, actually. And it wasn't fault advertising. This result is in the papers of, uh, of the uh, inventors, let's say, Lupi and Chakralahi. But people don't plot it, and then you simulate it, and you get surprised that these things don't really work, they're not really capacity achieving. So this is your binary erasure channel capacity, and your LT code, actually, the better the channel, the more you actually need to receive just to decode. All right. So now what happened, what started is uh, a 12-year process in a company called Digital Fountain, which eventually got sold to Quantum, to devise these Raptor codes, which are today in the standard. And lots of beautiful mathematics actually went in. Uh, and some very smart people uh, worked on that. So how did it go? Um, can we recover all data in a linear time uh, from order of k symbols? We cannot uh, under our probability. So for LT codes, we cannot do that. So when you are doing this Ernst and Bolts experiment, the, it takes, uh, okay, oh, maybe some of you know it is a coupon collection. How many coupons do I have to draw, or how many draws with replacement do I have to make in order to draw all coupons? And the expected value is n log n. So if I ask a little bit different question, if I have only n rows, how many coupons on average can I hope to get? Would it be some small fraction of n, order of n? So to get all, I need to make n log n rows. Okay, if I only make n rows, so log n times fewer than that, how many do I get? Because I want order of n number of edges, so how many do I get? So if you compute that by the same elementary probability, it has to be, you know, take a piece of paper and compute it. It turns out that you get about n half more actually, a little bit, um, on average. So, what you, um, by the first n rows, you get more than a half. And the second half, you need order of n log n, right? So when you realize that, uh, the uh, Raptor code people said, well, let's not cover all those axes. Okay, so if we are not covering them, then we 
somehow have to recover uh, what is not covered. How do we recover erased data? By an erasure code. So they made a concatenated code. So they put first uh, encode data, X, or pre-code them into some variable C1 to CM, and then pre-code, uh, and then uh, take the symbols, uh, the, the pre-code symbol C, and map them ratelessly. So now, even if you don't cover all of these with your LT equations, it's fine, because you don't need all these to recover X. So that, that was this um, additional invention, which again came from mathematical combinatorial reasoning, which kind of allowed them to uh, this recovery in the linear time. So they say, all right, but then you, you can say you, you have a pre-code, right? So that must have some complexity. So again, there are kind of proprietary ad hoc designs we don't know, but let's say that complexity is negligible. So but interesting, mathematically, that was the way to get rid of uh, this additional complexity. Um, all right, so further adapter remedy. Um, of your uh, com decoding complexity. You don't need now to cover everything, therefore uh, your, your graph doesn't have that many edges. However, because of the way it's constructed, you still need your equations to be linearly independent, right? But in order to make them linearly independent, you need again a little bit extra. So the problem of the overhead still remains. So you really want that green curve to move to the red curve to move to the capacity, right? Um, but at some point, your decoder will get stuck. So uh, there was a further invention which said, actually, how about doing this belief propagation, this uh, taking edges off one at a time, and when we get stuck, when we don't have this degree one anymore, we'll just invert a little matrix. And now that uh, uh, is, let's say, a very small matrix. And since, since it's a small matrix, it's not, it's inverting. It is, again, going to have a complexity, the dimension of the matrix cubed. But let's say the dimension is very small. So, so there is a little actually inverter. So, you know, things are getting sort of to look like a kitchen sink now. So there is first the pre-code, and now there is this Gaussian elimination and so on. All right. So there was actually lots of pure math and applied math that went into there. So these are uh, yeah, some of the smartest people I know, and not only the inventors, but a number of people who worked there. I had some of them as summer interns. There is lots of pure and applied math which went there. There is something called inactivation decoding, which is actually pretending that some things which you don't receive, uh, didn't receive or you cannot decode or actually cannot decode because they're degree two or something you did, so you sort of recover them at the very end. Uh, and they're integral part of what is now being deployed in the products, and that's something known as Raptor 10 or R10. So it's the 10th iteration of the Raptor code. So R10, if you hear, that is something which is now going to happen. All right, furthermore, uh, so a few weeks ago, actually, Mitchell Kalahi gave a talk at Bell Labs and told us a little bit about the history, also telling uh, who asked for something, uh, which CEO, what happened, uh, how things were named, and so on. And this is a little bit a more technical presentation, but it's uh, somehow also based by, on their monograph of, on, on foundations and trends of Raptor codes. All right. So now the next thing was um, a systematic code, right? Uh, system, they said, well, these codes are fine, but I'm getting these linear combinations straightlessly. I want a systematic code. So now you want a systematic raptor, right? And uh, they're useful. What is a systematic code? There is a systematic part, which is data, and then parity symbols that, that you have. A systematic data part is useful in practice. 
first is uh, decoding is not required when your digital data is received. So if you are receiving first K, your channel is ideal, you don't have to decode. Uh, in a broadcast, if for some kind of intermediate deployment, some phones will be able to decode and some will not. So you want them to be able to uh, at least receive the systematic part. And uh, sometimes it's also very important to have what data is, especially where the ones are or something, for various practical things, synchronization and so on, gain uh, estimates, and channel estimates and so on. So systematic code is needed. So how do we get systematic rateless code? So fixed rate code, you can multiply by an appropriate matrix, right, invertible matrix, to get the first so many columns of the generator matrix being identity. And that will get essentially the same erasure recovery capabilities. Maybe some, for some specific decoders, it's better one version or the other, but uh, the code is isomorphic to what you started with. How about a rateless code? Can I just take data and then generate Raptor the way I showed you? Is that an equivalent code? It's not really in terms of erasure rate. You cannot just generate, put data first, and then put a systematic, and now this is becoming your, your code. It's not uh, going to work that way. So lots of uh, work again went into this. Um, and, and now you have something called data and repair symbols. And Raptor 10 is also systematic. And uh, this is not connected. There is something in EMBS which we called uh, delivery phase and repair phase. And the delivery phase, you're, you send systematic bits, again, similar to hybrid air cube. Systematic bits and some parity bits. And then in the repair phase, uh, it's up to the receiver, is usually parity bits. So, because you want to send what you have not sent before. So this is um, in order to, they're good for diverse channels, but not very diverse, right? So if there are very many, if I'm doing a multicast, and there are many, very many different users, some will decode, and then we'll have to wait for a very long time for someone else to decode some more one. So you don't want that. You have this short delivery phase, and then there is a repair phase that uh, users who could not decode they get into the repair phase through unicast sessions. And um, they contact re so-called repair servers. So it may not be even the broadcast server who is doing, uh, uh, who is working on this repair phase. Right? And in many uh, schemes, um, especially source coding, we have somehow, first you send systematic, then you have some kind of analog refinement or some kind of uh, line receive additional bits to recover. So some of these things may be really very well matched uh, to be used in uh, these uh, Raptor schemes. Okay, so now uh, standardized Raptor codes. Let me just tell you how they look like. Uh, so this is from the uh, FNT tutorial by Shokalahi and Ruby, uh, where they say, their provable properties are even more real than theoretical proof. Uh, they're highly optimized software, uh, uh, highly optimized software implementing RT and RQ codes has been developed, tested, and deployed in mission critical applications. All right. So, um, uh, so now I'm going to put verbatim and annotate some claims which are made by the designers. Again, it took 12 years to develop. Is, uh, um, they're designed for applications with relatively modest requirements, Disruptor 10, mobile broadcast. Uh, works on source block which are of certain length, about uh, 8,000, uh, and supports certain uh, output, uh, number of encoded symbols, so, so much more. They can be made rateless, there is a claim, but they say in these particular applications, we don't expect to have more than this, right? Failure probability is 10 to the minus, minus six is, is uh, achieved with an overhead of a few 
new symbols for all supported block plan. Um, when they say overhead, it's not a transmission overhead. It's not how much more you have to transmit in order to get your K. And I actually removed a few slides from here, which I've used to show some of my uh, colleagues which are implementing this in practice, and uh, uh, which were concerned with uh, what that means. So your actual overhead is going to depend on the channel. Your additional overhead um, is what is required for the decoder. So that still exists. So it's not really zero. It's not like a read-tolerable code or anything like that. But it has, it, it's easier to encode and decode signals. Um, there is a catch there that actually, um, do you really receive much more than K? So what this overhead means, uh, one has to be careful. Raptor Q is actually Raptor 12, but it's called Q because of Qualcomm, which is a fountain was at about that time uh, bought by Qualcomm. At the ITA last year, uh, Roberto Padovani gave uh, a plenary talk and said that he considered, uh, considers Raptor phones to be one of the uh, most important things for immediate future wireless. And that was one of the reasons I, I chose this topic for and then there is also this claim, so these are these larger numbers, uh, exceptional overhead failure curves that are claimed, and overhead versus failure trade-off essentially mimics that of a random fountain code over the field with 256 elements. So now we sort of came a full circle. Uh, the, the claim is that whatever this is, whether it's over some other field or not, it has, um, it mimics the random fountain code over the field with that's the, what is a random code? So data symbols are mapped into symbols uh, also ratelessly, and now you just choose your coefficients uniformly at random. So in the monograph uh, that I mentioned, they're called random fountain codes. In network coding literature, they're called network codes, but they're actually just random codes, which we know. So what are after codes? So I really think it took uh, the inventors um, <laughs> as much work as to turn this origin to an apple or apple into an orange. So they are now um, codes which behave like random codes, but have linear encoding, linear decoding, or almost linear one and the other, with lots of little parts which are enabling so starting from this elegant LT coin tossing mathematics um, and runs and balls, you end up with uh, lots of other uh, very nice mathematics, but actually lots of small parts which make this apple in the orange, uh, only to claim that your performance are actually the same as the random. Okay. So now I'm going to ask, since we heard these two topics, on uh, on uh, ratelessness, increasing redundancy. I'm going to ask you, uh, does it matter? Uh, and is it overrated? Do we really have, have to go through all of this that we did? So ratelessness means different things to different people. Some people say encoder can produce potentially an infinite stream of symbols. And some say each code symbol is statistically identical. That means I only care how many I collect because they're all statistically identical. In hybrid RQ, we made them statistically identical in order to do the analysis. In rateless, they started they defined like that. Each symbol is generated in the same fashion, each encode symbol. A coin is tossed, symbols are picked, and they're exiled or linearly combined. So each one is the same. So does it really matter? Uh, and another question I want to ask you is, can fixed codes be made rateless? How would you make a fixed code rate? Repeat it, uh-huh, exactly. 
exactly. So why don't we repeat it? Why don't we do that? Probably so. It's okay. Let's let's see. So this is your uh, BC capacity. If you take a fixed rate code, uh, this is an LDPC code with some threshold epsilon star. That means that uh, epsilon star, uh, when your erasure rate on, on the x-axis, you have erasure rate. When your erasure rate is greater than epsilon star, you cannot decode it. If your uh, erasure rate gets better, you are not closer, your, your throughput is not very good because you have limited yourself by a fixed rate. Okay, so now, based on what we learned today, can you do something about this blue curve to approach the red curve? We heard some ideas. There was puncturing, there was repetition, there was uh, some other things. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. Or uh, there are now these uh, tablets, which, does anyone have a writing tablet with pen on it? Okay, so s start with this red curve. This is a blue curve. What can I do with, the, with this fixed rate code to make, it, to make the blue approach red? If you like to work in groups, it's fine also. any code. I, I uh, knew a threshold actually, this, this was drawn in PostScript for a particular number, so I plotted it like that. It can be any code. So one of the most important things is pra in practice today is scalability. This is called a cliff effect. So what can we So the channel here is, uh, if it's better than epsilon star, you have more in your code than you need. So what can you do? Puncture it? Okay. If you puncture it one bit at a time, uh, the, the, this horizontal curve would get closer to to the red curve, how? Would, would it be some kind of a quadratic, linear? What would it be? How much can you puncture it? If, okay, a question. If I don't have anything erased on the channel, if my epsilon, uh, this epsilon here, this one here is zero, how much can I puncture this code? Code has a, thresh, a threshold epsilon star. How much can I move? Right? So, so what does threshold say in LDPC code? It says if, if the channel does not erase more than epsilon star, you can decode. That's what the threshold says. And if the channel does not erase anything, I can puncture it myself, right? So this would go up to here. So you can increase your R divided by one minus epsilon star, and you get pretty close, actually, without much work. You're just taking an off-the-shelf code, erasure code, without going through 10 years of design. Okay, beyond, now I, I ran out of, my, uh, of, of all my bits. I am at epsilon star, what, what can I do? I send everything, but whatever I've sent, 
cannot help me beyond epsilon star because that's what the threshold uh, of the code tells me. What can I do? So someone said we can repeat, right? How do we repeat? Shall we choose something? Suppose we don't have, okay. We cannot, uh, Raptor codes don't have a feedback. So that's their big claim to fame. They're rateless, they don't have feedback. What can we do if we don't have a feedback? What, what do we always do in information theory? Repeat at random, right? We repeat at random, uh, what is the probability that a particular bit did not reach a repeated uh, one? If there were two transmissions, it would be a probability that it didn't reach the first time times the probability that it didn't reach the second time, right? So this would increase up to what would here be on the x axis? It would be square root of epsilon. So if we repeat everything half, everything again, the probability that a particular one didn't reach would be epsilon squared, and therefore, since everything is repeated, your rate is half of what you had, but you go to square root epsilon. And then you can continue repeating. You will go more and more down, but this is an off-the-shelf code, which is not even a particularly good code. It was away from the capacity, right? And the LT by itself gives you something which is not as good. Raptor codes, though, they are, right, what did we say they are? They are ach re achieving this red curve, but they are, you know, something which is kind of obscure. So we can say they are capacity achieving, but they are specially optimized designed, and, uh, and we can say they are red curve, right? But there is, you know, lots of work associated with that intellectual property and so on. Why does repeating work here? What if I started repeating each one from the beginning? I have a very good channel and I'm repeating. Is that good? So when you run out of your bits, that means that you're past the threshold. That means that the channel is bad. And then which kind of codes become optimal for such channels? Repetition codes, right? For bad channels, repetition codes is what, what is good. And in a general, what do we do when someone didn't hear us completely? What do we do? We repeat. <laughs> if someone didn't hear, if I know that someone heard me, um, then I tried maybe to use a synonym or something. And sometimes people know based on side information, their own language or a Latin root or something like that. But if someone didn't hear me at all, I just repeat. And that is what's go going on here. In the, in, at the time when you are in a position to repeat, your SNR, your erasure rate is already very bad, that means, that means you're doing really well. So are we making much about nothing? I don't know. Uh, the point here is that what really gets into practice is what you really are willing to put work into and what you really are willing to explain to other people and convince other people and uh, put many, many hours uh, to have uh, be understood both theoretically and to have a product which is tested in software in the critical vision or whatever it was that we said. Right, so that is what we talked about. And what I want to argue now is actually the hardest battles are still to come. Um, I started working at Bell Labs at um, this kind of elongated picture. This is, this is short. It doesn't look like that. So, um, in 1994, and this is how my group looked like at that time. Department head was Jim Mazo here. Uh, Aaron Weiner was the department head uh, just up to two years before I joined, and um, he was already getting sick, and he stepped down, but he was, I think, leading the group for 22 years. Jacob Ziv is here. Uh, he used to come for the summer, as this picture is taken in the summer of I believe 95, but uh, many argue it's 94. In any case, I started working at the Labor Day of 94. Um, there is Tom Richardson, and these people with kind of hair, like young looking, Emre Teletar, uh, Rajiv Laroya, Alon Orlitsky, uh, Henry Landau still runs our Landau seminar at the labs. And uh, actual 
Actually, my job at the labs was really pushing codes into, into various products. I here uh, mentioned two because they're relevant today, but I worked for uh, about 10 years on storage, a little bit uh, less, um, and uh, whichever you had in, in, in your product at some point was, was designed by us. Um, optical codes and whatnot. And what I believe is actually that the hardware battle are st battles are still to come. Because on a physical layer, it's sort of a closed box. You have your SNR, which may not be what you expected, but it's still SNR. You have your noise, which may be a colored, but when you assumed white, but it's still somehow whatever you do provides a good bound. What I want to argue now is that now we really need to careful, be careful if we want to put codes into uh, systems um, uh, into clouds because there are just too many moving parts. It's very hard to determine what the coding gain is. Um, so in a, here I'm going to list what was then when I uh, started working in, in, in the first, let's say, 10 years of, of my work. I, I, I've been there for, al for almost 19 years. And what is now? So now let's say the browser is Google Chrome. What was what did we have in 94? This was there. Uh, how? Netscape? Oh, what was the precursor to Netscape? Mosaic. Exactly. So that's what we had. We didn't even, at some point, Alona Litsky uh, made web pages for us um, at the labs. So that is what we had. We had point to point, and now we have networks. Uh, we had coding for physical layer. What do we have now? Coding beyond physical layer. <laughs> All right, so don't be afraid to volunteer. Uh, we had hybrid air queue, not at the time of Mosaic, a little bit later, almost 10 years later, uh, well, five years, let's say. What do we have now? after Q. We had to worry about implementation at that time. When you propose the code, you have to see, do we need, uh, how many um, uh, circuits do we need uh, for, for operation? So implementation was a big thing. Now everything is so miniaturized that that's not an issue. What do we have to worry now? We have to worry about modeling. We assume various independence and whatnot and it's actually not true. So I'll try to illustrate that on, on, on some of the things we're going to talk about now. We had, because of implementation, we had to deal with hardware guys. And now, I personally have a systems girl. I have a lady. <laughs> I have a lady at Bell Labs with whom I uh, work and we have put our summer interns in the same room this year. Uh, hers is a hacker and my intern is um, Anki Travat from uh, UT Austin, you may know. And we had cost in EB over N0. Uh, when you put additional bits for coding, that is what you have to pay. You, you use additional energy. Now we have, when we use this, we code over packets and we put additional disks, we had cost in traffic. Because there are now packets that are going through the network. So how do we, how do we measure that? Is not we had alphabet size to worry about when we decode for implementation, higher the field, the higher to invert the matrix. Now we have to worry about packetization, what it means. We had color noise, now we have fork join queues, which you are going to, I'm going to talk about in this talk. We had various, uh, many more things, traffic patterns, authentication, addressing uh, in content-centric networks, and shortly, coding gain very hard to estimate. There is no formula which takes into account coding rate and EV over N0, which will give you coding gain. Okay, so let's say you want to get content from the clouds. You want to get actually a rain, and you come with a cup, and you hope it will rain. And you wait for some time, and it starts raining, but not under your cloud, right? So it's just content is not available there. So what do you do? You place yourself everywhere. But this costs something. We don't know how much, but, but let's say we, we just go everywhere. Then when it uh, rains, these two guys get their cups filled and they're happy, right? 
but I don't really need two cups, so I can take one and I can throw away the other. That, that has its costs, right? So I can say, YouTube has multiple uh, TCP connections. I can say I'll start all of them and then I'll terminate some. But that may have some cost associated with it. We have to take all that into account. And very often we kind of throw our hands, what, what do we do there? Let's do some complete theory and put our stack of books between us and, and the rest of the world and we'll propose something. But then you realize if there are uh, several things that can happen at the same time, Maybe uh, this guy didn't have to have this big cup. He could have arrived with a small cup and each one of them could have taken half in parallel, right? So I could have had here uh, these two people, each one would, would fill the cup in half the time. So I could have done that, right? And then you can also ask yourself, what if I have multiple people? Well, if, if it's a broadcast, if it's just raining on, on them at the same time, then uh, uh, you don't really worry uh, about them being uh, together. But usually you have queues. So we'll talk about queues later. But this is easier to understand, but users do not really affect each other. So this is how the, uh, I'm going to, so, so what, what I told you now is going to be the following model. User requests uh, the same content. Many Several of us want the same content, they want uh, rain, we want water, right? Uh, and that's stored in the cloud. And the content is split into K blocks, and then it's encoded into N blocks so that K out of N blocks are sufficient for reconstruction. So, so it's an MDS code, let's say. Or some other number, but let's say some smaller number, K out of N, maybe K is not the original K blocks, but K out of N is sufficient for reconstruction. So now each user request is sent to multiple servers and, and you are asking for content in multiple servers and, and server acquires a content from the cloud at some time WS, which may depend on the server, uh, which will depend on the server on the cloud and delivers it by broadcast to users in some time DS. And what I'm going to assume is that DS is something somehow concentrated around its mean. Uh, how long it will take to, once when it starts raining, um, your cup gets filled, and that only depends on the size of the cup. Maybe some drops will go out, but not, there will not be many of them. So the time to fill your cup once when it starts raining is determined by the size of the cup, with a little variation. But the time until it starts raining, it will be some exponential distribution, which I'm going, some distribution which has a mean W. But for computation, I will take it that I have to wait some exponential time. Okay. So, um, all right. Um, how many of you know, uh, ha uh, have you heard about order statistics? Okay, some have. So, if I have, random variables x1 to xn, that the kth smallest among them uh, is a random variable uh, which we denote by k comma n and it's called order statistics. There are very nice, pay actually it's a fairly new concept, uh, older than me, but you know, it was written, uh, it was a, 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 a first papers that, that you can find that actually in, in the 50s, even probability is not that old subject, but there are very nice papers by uh, Renyi, uh, I think uh, some were written or even as thoughts given in honor of Kolmogorov's uh, uh, Jubilee birthday, something like that. So you can, uh, uh, if you're interested to read about it, it's a very, uh, they're very beautifully written. It's interesting that when uh, xi is exponential and it, uh, then the mean and variance you can find. And the uh, mean is W, times the difference between these two harmonic numbers. So basically when uh, k is one, the minimum, uh, the, uh, let's see, the maximum, the smallest, whatever, um, the, uh, the, the first will happen with, with, uh, in, in the waiting time w over n, and the last in w times about log n. So there is a uh, range of this. So when you're waiting for, from n clouds to start raining, chances are you're going to be uh, lucky with at least one of them. 
So you would like to go everywhere to get your copy. But as we said, that may cost something, and that is what we take into account, have to take into account. Because this is new, I don't know how to take that. Maybe I'll run this summer, but I don't know how to take that into account. Um, what I'm going to, what I first have to show is that there is some gain to be had uh, if, when I neglect such costs. And if this is some kind of a reasonable or large gain, then I may look into what, uh, what is going to cost me to implement it. And the point is that this decrease, uh, that, that this increase uh, for a fixed 10, uh, when k decreases the, the expected value decreases. So the mean download time uh, in the model we just showed with these clouds is going to be W times this difference in harmonic numbers. When K is some constant fraction of N. So the harmonic number is log N. When K is a constant fraction of N, uh, what is the order of the difference of two harmonic numbers? So each one is actually order log N. So log N, the other one is log of N minus K log when you divide log, I mean when you took a difference of logs is log over n over n minus k. If k is a constant fraction of n, you have kind of a constant, right? So you're losing log n. Whenever you have difference between two harmonic numbers, you're losing the log n. Then uh, k is a constant fraction of n. So if you make that approximation with log n, then you can define, uh, then you can find uh, some optimum k that you should have. So you divide your file into k blocks, you encode them into n, and now you are asking, given n, given the number of clouds, given the number of disks, what, k, what should k be? And of, uh, why would I want a small k? Small k may give me lots of diversity, so, so this is the minimum. I, I, in, in terms of weighting, I am better off if k is small. But why do I want large k? Because then I get to partition everything if k is equal to n into n parts, and then I can do this reading in parallel. So I have what I need to fill is small cups, and I can fill them in parallel. So there are two opposing conditions here for k. I want large k because then I have small chunks to ask for small cups to fill, and I, I want small k because if it works only at one place, I'm in business if k is one. But if k is larger, it has to work in k out of n. So there are two opposing things, and there is some up, and depending on how uh, big is d compared to w, I would have a different uh, trade-off. So this expected response time of this system uh, if W is 1 and D is 2, is the, is the green, and then the red if it's the other way around. So see, the K kind of moved. It depends how W and D are, are connected. And that can be found mathematically. There was this formula which uh, you, you approximate the first equation by a log, you differentiate, you find your minimum, so easy. And you say, see, I can tell you what the object there is a problem, right? Uh, we don't really know what the optimal k is because there are these other things that we have to take into account which are not taken here. So if you design your systems, you have to worry about that. So this is uh, me when I'm at a conference. I take one big coffee mug in the morning and, and then maybe in the afternoon if there is a, for two reasons. I have to wake up and also it's not clear whether coffee will be available later. If I'm at work, it's something like this. I have lots of little uh, espressos or something like that. It takes seven espressos for a 14 ounce coffee. That's equivalent in caffeine. So it's the same thing in equivalence in caffeine, but is this really the same? I mean, you have to ask a person who is washing these cups. So how do we really, we have to somehow mathematically first be aware of that and then explain to systems people what they have to tell us how much this costs. And only then you will be able to modify in some reasonable way, never exactly as in practice, this, uh, uh, this uh, W, uh, this red and, and green curves. So there are other things, not only the ratio between W and N. Okay. Another 
assumption that we made here is some kind of a broadcast. When it rains, it rains on everyone. Um, that's not exactly the case, right? People, when they ask for content, they queue. And, and the reason for that is you can't serve only so many people in parallel. Why is that? Why can you not go to infinity? Because there is a capacity limit, like, right? Usually in practice people say there is bandwidth. So you can serve only so many people. At the same time, the other ones wait in a queue. So as we move to implement encoding, and if you want to make information theory relevant for other uh, applications, we have to take that into account. And this is a picture from my state, New Jersey, at about uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, time. So there, were, um, there was rationing on the on fuel, so you couldn't really go and fill up your car, so you really you had to take these uh, uh, containers and have them filled. And people were actually doing exactly what we are proposing to do here with the content, and that is different members of the family go to different places with multiple containers and try to fill. And you're kind of operating your neighborhood. And maybe once when you have five, if you have a big family or big neighborhood, five out of ten field, you will call some the others and say, don't stay on the cold anymore, don't stay in line. But still, this person had to go there, had to take uh, his car or walk or something to, to get gas. So, so there is a cost associated with that. So this is exactly what we do in real life, but we here have to prove, you know, whether that, that that's actual use. So, we're going to do some uh, simple, okay, maybe you don't do research in queuing theory, maybe you had just a, some stochastic processing class. There is a, a basic object, which is M1Q, and here requests arrive at rate lambda according to, some, to a Poisson process, and the service time has an exponential distribution with the rate mu. And many metrics of interest are understood for this model. In particular, it's known that the response time is exponential with the rate mu minus lambda. And that means when you, are, so, so when you arrive to this Q, you expect to be out in some time t, and that's distributed exponentially with, uh, with uh, mean 1 over mu minus lambda or with the rate mu minus lambda. So we understand that. If we make that just a little more complicated, and uh, the first time this model was defined, I believe it was in the 70s, we have four join Q. And this is, you split on arrival jobs, which you have to join on departure. So again, suppose you're coming to a supermarket with a family and let's say with a bunch of friends here, and the one who likes sweets goes to, uh, I don't know, cookie line, another milk line, another and so on. And you have to get your groceries, and then you have to go back with the same car, right? So you have to join uh, people on departure. This, when you have uh, Poisson arrivals and exponential service time, it's known as Plato Han Wright model. Plato was a person missing on the picture I showed you uh, before. And uh, Wright also worked at a lot, I'm not sure about Han, um, he, uh, it, it is seen as a key model for par parallel and distributed systems. You know, it's used in RAID, this model. And there is a renewed interest in the problem now through this Google MapReduce and whatnot. Because in a MapReduce, if you're familiar with that, map is the fourth part and reduce is the join part. Uh, very few analytical results are, uh, exist, but various So how are we going to adopt this to our, uh, to our uh, problem? So we are going to have architecture which looks like the following. Uh, F is split uh, the content, the file, into K blocks again, and uh, they're encoded by an MDF code and KMDS code, and then any K out of N are sufficient for decoding. And the uh, 
part here is that n encoded blocks are stored on n disks, on n independent servers or independent clouds or independent distribution here. Uh, operation is such that user requests uh, for file f are forked into all n disks and then uh, downloads from nk jointly will enable reconstruction of f. Now your arrival rate to each node is still lambda because you you're, you go everywhere once when you arrive. But your service rate is uh, larger, meaning jobs are going out faster. Why? Because they have to read smaller files. So if you have partitioned your content into K pieces, you, your reading time is going to be whatever it was before divided by K. So you're going to go out K times faster, so service rate is K. And here is a, a picture. So here you're arriving with an empty disk and you have A, B, and A plus B on three different disks. Whichever you download first, here it happened to be A plus B and B, you can, uh, you're done. So this is sort of like the butterfly example for, for this job. So any two are, are fine. And here I have storage 50% uh, higher. If I, just download, if I just have one, I would just have A and B on a single disk. So now I have 50% higher, but the download time per disk and overall is reduced. And that's what I want to find by how much. Here is a little bit more about operation. So this is uh, the file comes and it's, uh, and uh, the requests are uh, put in all queues. At some point, uh, the blue, that was the first arrival, uh, is done, the two jobs are done. And this one abandons the queue. So we have, in the beginning it looked really scary because we said not only that the original problem is not solved, but we are now making this problem more complex. We have even departures for queues. How, how would we ever be able to solve something like this? Okay. So what about stability of this? Um, Stability in queuing is uh, you have to be able to uh, serve what comes. Otherwise, at a higher rate than the arrival. Otherwise, you would have the queues which go to infinity. Uh, so your effective service time per node is going to be lambda minus what abundance your queue. But if you have k are going to be processed have to be processed in order to, to finish, to, to complete your file, then what is going to abandon the queue will be n minus k, or n minus k out of n, because these are eights. So your, your effective rate is reduced, and your service rate is higher, because now you're, you're, you're serving, a, reading only a part of the file, and therefore your lambda has to be smaller than n mu. If you didn't have this process, it would be lambda smaller. So your, st uh, your queue is stable for a long time. The one that is easy to analyze, so finally something, so what is, what is considered before is NN, right? But we have coding, so we can consider NK. N1 is very easy to analyze, and the way you actually realize that is when you start writing a simulation program, which I wanted to, to do, which I actually did last year at this time, a little bit earlier, because again, interests were coming, I wanted to see if this would work or not putting someone in charge of the project. So the effective arrival rate per node is lambda over n. That comes from, uh, from here, if you de derive this by this lambda over n, um, when k is 1. And the system behaves as independent queues. Why? Because you serve one job, and all of the siblings from other nodes depart. So you don't have to worry about them, so there is nothing left to introduce dependence. So these are actually independent queues. It's exactly like the broadcast model that we talked about for N1. And so the system response time can be found in the closed form. It's, an exponen it's exponential and it's given by that. And the fact that you have this N, uh, it's actually effectively increases your service rate. What do you have to pay? multiple storage because you have to have now your entire content available on each disk. 
because you are forking it to this n, and each one has to have entire. It's not one has to have a, another b, another a plus b, so half. You have to have another complete copy. When you do these simulations, uh, these are the histograms of, uh, this is when you have k1, it's exactly exponential, the response time. And these are the uh, envelopes of, of these histograms. What someone would ask you in practice is not how your probability distribution looks like, but they will ask you how many customers will be served in so much time. So it's not PDF, it's CDF. They will not ask you what is your CDF, they will ask you how many customers, but this is a CDF, so you can plot that. And if this is your reference point, so if you didn't do this, um, this multiplication, uh, you would have this black point, this, this uh, spreading of the content, you would have this black uh, line. This, this figure here on the right is just the zoom version of the left, zoom up to here. Um, and you see that it takes two time units for everyone to finish if you have just a single disk, but much, much faster things happen when you have, uh, when you do coding. Um, and, uh, and actually it's interesting things that this red and green curves cross. And we don't really know because we don't know probability distributions of these. We don't even know the expected values. We have just very good bounds, actually, okay. So what happens is if you just have 10 disks, if you put your content everywhere available, you can go to the red curve. If you put your content uh, available just one fifth on each disk, you can have the green curve and they're actually not that different. So there is some trade off between the storage, which reflects then energy and, uh, and the download time. Uh, the blue curve is the fork joint queue of the original. All right. Uh, what if I ask you to double the storage, but I don't limit the number of disks. I can tell you double it. One possibility is take two, two disks and put your file disk one, disk two, and ask for two. Another possibility is put it on four disks and take one, four, uh, one half because you're doubling the storage on, on each disk and so on. What is better? Four or two or 10 maybe? What are you doing when uh, you are multiplying these things? You are actually improving the diversity of the system, right? So the diversity is good and the more disks you have, the better. Although essentially you're only doubling the storage everywhere. So the more this the better, because it's diversity. But again, is really, if it's more this the better, you have to go to all of these places, right? If you are after with your little canister going to take a, a five gallons of gas or something, you have to really go there. So there is cost associated with that, which we are not taking into account. We are just saying the more diversity, the better. Okay, so for our n k system and k is equal n, that means that uh, there is no redundancy, that's a fork joint. Uh, when k is equal one, it means basically replication. So it's a repetition code, you have replicated it everywhere. And uh, when uh, k is between one and n, it's coding. And there is no independence between the queues. So that is going to be hard to analyze, that's why uh, even for the fork join, the previous work has attempted finding T and N, but only bounds are known. And this looks discouraging uh, because you say, I don't even work in that area, they only know bounds, what can I possibly do? But then you realize for coding, you really need to know just the behavior. And if these bounds that they found somehow behave logarithmically, uh, then there is a chance that when you cut this tail, remember a coupon collection analogy where in the first end you get a half and then you take 
log n times as long to get another half. If you just cut a little bit and they behave like that, then it's a hope. So there is a hope for, for coding. Maybe even some analytical claims can be made. And it turns out that we can find some bounds. So people who worked on me on this are uh, Gauri Joshi. She's uh, a student at MIT and another student in um, Wisconsin, Jan Tay Liu. Uh, and uh, actually, this was not there. So Gauri was uh, here, he was office mate uh, last summer working on something else, but then after she left, like the last week of her internship, we said, well, let's do something else because you've made with very good progress and this is sort of after the internship work. So for NK system, uh, the fork, uh, uh, we, we can do the following modification. Something similar for NN is called a split branch. So uh, in a fork join, if uh, I and several other people, let's say Gauri and Yampe are in the line, and we are trying to, we each have, we are in a grocery store, each one of us has a basket full of stuff, um, and we are trying to pay. Once when I pay, I move out, say I, I was the luckiest, the first one. Whoever is behind me, right, um, say Hajar, for example, she can get already served by the cashier while Gauri and Jan Pei are waiting. In a split and merge, as long as the Gauri and Jan Pei are still in line, no one behind me can start getting service. So fork join, through fork join, things are, will be moving faster. And because things are moving faster, whatever I find for split and merge is going to be an upper bound. But for a split and merge, I have uh, a dependence uh, so uh, I don't have a dependence, so I'm going to try to capitalize on that. So a little bit of that, and again going back to order statistics and knowing their uh, distribution, uh, uh, sorry, not distribution, but at least the variance and the mean, I can use something known as palachuk hinchin formula, which basically tells you uh, the expected response time for an MG1Q, and that is a Q with exponential arrivals and general departures. Why are departures generals uh, for me? Because of these dynamics that I created, they are actually k order statistics. And, but I know the uh, expectation and the variance, so I can use this formula. There is a reasoning about, uh, okay, there is a stability then condition for these. Uh, again, the service time, the arrival rate and the service time have to be related in the right fashion, right? You cannot have uh, too many arrivals if you don't have adequate service. And the service here is given by this Kate order statistics. And there is, a, there is a, a condition which is actually a stronger condition than your uh, condition for the stability of the fork join Q. And because of that, your bounds are not going to hold for a wide range of mu's and k's. And this uh, hn minus hn minus k over k is actually a monotone function. So you will see, you will say that if for some point, some k this bound is not tight, that is not going to be tight for any k beyond that because it simply is not going to be stable. Um, so we couldn't use what was previously available in literature here. And the reason is that the bound that was derived by this Nelson and Tantawi approach is um, using the fact that uh, the response times of Qs are so-called associated random variables. So I'm not sure whether you know about associated random variables in Earth and Bolt there. That's kind of quintessential example. But it's somehow, these are variables which are not independent there is a formal definition what they have to satisfy, but the dependence is somehow clear, like in the urns and the balls, or the nature of the dependence. If a ball goes into this urn, that means it didn't go into the, the other urn. So whatever, is, whatever you have more here, you have fewer there. So when you have, and it's called associated, of course, with formal math definitions, and when you deal with these various, uh, sometimes some of these variables, like associated, martingales, or whatnot, we can 
say some things about them. So we don't need really independence always. Um, and for this bound, this Nelson and Fantavi, they, uh, reali they realize that the expected maximum of these associated random variables is smaller than that of the independent random variables with the same marginal. Uh, and we couldn't use that approach. And the reason is that it does not hold for the order of this. When k is smaller than n. When k is equal to n, that means that the maximum is already known. So one has to be careful with such things. So we derived our own bound, which is fine. Uh, for uh, for um, a lower bound, we have used approach which is available in the literature. I'm not going to go, to go through that. But let me just look at to how tight these bound, uh, bounds are. They're actually pretty tight. There is a flat point here where I did simulations. Um, and, and then uh, blue below is the lower bound and then the upper bound. And lambda is one, and here mu service time is much higher rate, so almost no one gets in to wait in the queue for long. And, uh, and here is, is almost the same, so the borderline of stability, sort of. And the bounds are tight. Uh, they become not tight when you have large service time, right, or, or small service rate mu. Why is that? Because the approximation is made by this split merge queue. And that was the queue which I said, I'm blocking the queue where I'm in as long as my collaborators are also sitting in a queue. And if the service rate is fast, the queue is not going to stay blocked for a long time. And therefore, it's when mu is large, the rate of service is, is high, then uh, it's going to be a very tight bound. Otherwise, it's not going to be. You can drop mu even further and slowly, this, uh, uh, if you look here uh, in the left hand si right hand side for uh, K9, it's already not tight. If you drop mu, uh, this, this kind of departure is going to happen earlier. And uh, one of the reasons is this stability. All right, so we went through some really kind of nice math, so not very easy uh, to, definitely not a classroom, not an information theoretic kind of. Uh, much to derive some of these things, but um, we have made some, uh, some assumptions about independence. So these are these uh, people waiting in a queue, and there are three cashiers, right? So what they do is I split them. This is my fork. I split them in in uh, uh, in three. And here on purpose, the cashiers are different so that I can make an assumption that service times are independent. Um, if they're the same, suppose that is some kind of a computer system where you don't have to fetch a content, you're just reading it, then it really depends on what's being read or depends on the person. And the thing is that if you look at that lady which is reading a newspaper, in front of her there is someone sleeping. In all the queues, this person is going to be sleeping in front of this lady. So if he is blocking her in one queue, it will be, he will be blocking her in the other queue. So basically, uh, if these are the same cashiers, everything is the same, we are only splitting the load. It's only parallel processing. There is no diversity gain. There is no load balancing gain because everyone uh, is in the same queue. You can enlarge a number of queues so that maybe three people go here, but then some other people go somewhere else, so you don't always have the same bunch in front of you. Uh, here you can use very nice algebra maybe to, to find, you can maybe use combinatorial designs which will ensure that if someone from one family is in front of you in one queue, then that never happens anywhere else. So some such thing, maybe also with some such things you can make every queue statistically identical. But it may be that there is no independence, and it's exactly the independence that we, we want to capitalize on. So if you take a heavy tail, so, so we analyze the number of different service times, general service time, heavy tail service time, some various overheads of reading, fetching, and whatnot. So, um, so um, 
here is a Pareto distribution and this parameter uh, determines the service time. So our old friend is this blue. So it went like this, the, the higher the K, the higher the service time, but the lower the storage. So this is the, uh, if you have a very heavy tail distribution, it can be a completely different picture, which is the best to use large K actually. Or it can be something in between. There would be an optimal case as we have seen with the clouds. So this really depends on your assumptions. You can also, uh, and this is what I was just talking about, again, blue is our. Here alpha denotes something else. When alpha is one, is everything is the same. People just split, it's just three copies. So it's only parallel processing. So of course then uh, the one is the worst because there is no split. The 10 is the best because this had the 10. The only thing we have is parallelism to benefit from. And if you have kind of a mixture, a little bit independence and little bit dependence, uh, which we can, uh, just, uh, just simulated actually, we didn't analyze that analytically, then you again have some optimum K. So with all of these uh, bounds and mass that we did, the only thing we actually, uh, actually they not fly at all, someone will implement it and say, you know, all these gains that you're pre predicting are not there. And that's something which on the physical layer was not exactly the case, right? We said, yeah, no, it's turned out to be colored, but fine. I mean, uh, uh, maybe the gain is not 10, it's 8.5 or something, but it's still in the same ballpark, but it's still a gain, it's not a loss. Here, there are just too many moving parts which we will have to take into account if we have to put something out. So how much you do math, how much you model, what do you really uh, do? Uh, it's, a, it's a big question. And whether you decide to be a uh, faculty professor tomorrow or you decide to go in industry, you will have to justify your work. If you are a professor, you will have to write grants. If you are in industry, you will have to uh, get approvals uh, for something to work on and so on. If we don't do that, well, you know, the future may not look so bright. We may not have places where to put our codes them for free because they will cost something to implement. What kind of jobs do we do at Bell Labs? Well, now there is a hiring freeze, but usually help is wanted for a jack of all trades and master of none to complete 80% of half of the list of some of the jobs that we prepare. Okay. And to conclude, uh, I'd like to cite Giancarlo Rota, who's a mathematician, Wherever you see mathematician, you can replace information theorist. In his book, in Indiscreet Thoughts, in 1996, he said, believe me, the engineer does not want you to solve his or her problem. Then he went and talks about some of his experience and continues and says, what the engineer wants is, um, that he says respect and whatnot, it says, most of all to be listened to in rapt attention. If you do this, he or she will be likely to hit upon a clever new idea as he or she explains the problem to you and you will get some of the credit. Listening to engineers and other scientists is uh, part of our duty. You may even occasionally